On February 9th of 2004, 21-year-old UMass student Maura Murray drove from her dorm in Amherst, Massachusetts to the White Mountains of New Hampshire. At approximately 7.27 p.m., Maura spun out her 1996 Saturn on a hairpin turn on Route 112 in North Haverhill. There has never been a credible sighting of Maura since. Maura is five foot, seven inches tall. She weighs 120 pounds, and she has brown hair and hazel eyes. If you have any information regarding Maura's disappearance, please submit it to us, the Murray family through their Facebook page, or the New Hampshire State Police Cold Case Unit. This is Missing Maura Murray. Welcome back to Missing Maura Murray. I'm Tim here today with Lance in the Crawl Space Studios in Wormtown. Lance, how are you today? Oh, I'm doing very well. How are you today, Tim? I'm doing all right. And uh, we have a bit of a blast from the past in this episode, Lance, don't we? Yeah, yeah. James Renner puts the uh, puts the blast in the past, as they say. I don't know what that means, but it was uh, it's a good conversation that we had with him, and it was uh, a, a bit overdue to uh, catch back up with him and... I mean, the primary reason why we wanted to talk to him was to attempt to shed some light on the allegations that have been brought against Mora's ex-boyfriend, Bill Rausch. So that's part of the uh, conversation that we have with him in this interview. Okay, so I hope you enjoy it and get something out of it. Uh, Check out James Renner's blog. There is a link in the show notes and also to his book. So thank you very much for listening. Welcome back to the Missing Maura Murray podcast. James Renner, how are you today, James? Uh, I'm great. I'm great. Is this the, hey, I, I was wondering, is this the first time I've been back since uh, since you wrangled me? Oh, boy. Not including CrimeCon? Oh, uh, well, yeah, I guess there was CrimeCon. Yeah, yeah, but I think officially, as far as an episode goes, I, I <laughs> since you wrangled me, I'll stop. <laughs> it was just a cool title. <laughs> <laughs> wrangling renner <laughs> yeah well i'm i'm glad personally to hear that you're doing well that you said you're doing well because it's been a, a trying year for you i was gonna say a trying couple of months but it's been a it's been a, a a hard year for you is that is that accurate well you know not really i mean in in the very limited space of what is the the Maura murray um you know, mystery. Uh, yeah, there's, it's, it's been, (laughs) it's been a little wonky. Um, but outside of that, it's, it's a very small part of my life anymore. Um, you know, outside of that, uh, I've had another book that came out and, um, uh, I've started a nonprofit, uh, raising money for, um, uh, new DNA testing for cold cases. I've been on this comedy tour. So I've been, I've been having a great time, you know, outside of, Outside of everything that uh, that is the Moore Murray case. All right, cool. So tell us about the comedy tour. Yeah, you know, I took a look at the comedy scene and I realized what they were missing was uh, was murder. Uh, <laughs> really? <laughs> and uh, um, you know, what actually what inspired me was um, do you guys remember this? Uh, do you guys remember Spalding Gray at all? Spalding Gray sounds so familiar. Was he an actor? It sounds familiar. Yeah. Um, he, you know, he was this like monologuist in the eighties and he, he got famous for a little while for this, uh, swimming to Cambodia, um, and monster in a box. And he would sit behind a desk on stage and he would tell these fascinating stories about his life, um, that were sometimes humorous and, uh, nobody's really kind of done that since then. And, um, I got to thinking about him for a couple reasons in the last year. Um, I, I had a chance to do a workshop with him um, about 15 years ago. He came into Cleveland, and I got to meet this guy who was like a, a hero of mine. And um, and it was probably about six months 
maybe it was was shortly thereafter where he uh, committed suicide back in New York. Um, He stepped off the Staten Island Ferry. Oh, wow. You know, so I I found myself in New York last year um, doing some reconnaissance on Governor's Island. And you see uh, the Staten Island Ferry. And and I'm like, oh, you know, it just kind of put his... um, his, his name in my mind again. And, and, and I realized nobody's really doing the Spalding Gray stuff. So I thought what might work is essentially what would be a monologue um, that is, uh, you know, has some jokes, has some humor, has some funny, but it's also stories about working as a true crime journalist in, in Cleveland for um, uh, about 10 years. And uh, all the the scary situations I got myself into and and bizarre people I met, and so that became this tour that I put together called the uh, Confessions of a True Crime Addict, and uh, yeah, so I toured. Um, you know, I made it a part of the Crime Con thing this year. So I drove down to Nashville and did Zanies in Nashville, and then uh, Birmingham and into New Orleans and up the East Coast, and then I just got back from a tour of the West Coast. How did that go? It went great. Yeah, it's going really well. I think if, you know, I'm having a lot of luck with these comedy clubs because um, <laughs> what, what I'm doing for them is bringing them new people, you know, people that wouldn't normally be going to a comedy club on a, on a weeknight. And, you know, of course, that gets them, you know, uh, hopefully more repeat customers. And, and so it's a niche that nobody's really... Nobody, nobody else is really filling, at least not in the comedy clubs. Well, that's cool. Yeah, I was going to ask if um, the most of the audience is people who follow you regularly, or if there are people who uh, are local to the area and just wanted to see an interesting show. It's it's mostly the latter. Um, it's mostly people that are just interested in true crime in general. Most of these people have not heard of me, um, and uh, you know, but also. Uh, I, I would say a good chunk of the the audience um, is uh, they're mur- murderinos. You know, they follow um, my favorite murder um, that that podcast and and what they what that podcast is really good at doing is creating these little communities that that find each other and go to their shows. And so when they hear about this, they they bring their group down and. Uh, um, so it's, it's, it's worked out well. Do you get any requests for uh, certain stories that people know about, whether they've read uh, your book on uh, Amy Mahalovic or whether they read True Crime Attic? Do you, uh, do you take yeah. requests from the audience? No, I don't. I, I have a pretty, pretty, um, pretty tight set, as they say. Uh, it's, you know, it's about an hour and 15, an hour and 20 minutes. Oh, and, wow. uh, you know, it has its own structure. Um, you know, and I don't do Q and A's or anything like that. I just get up, I perform, I tell these stories. Um, you know, I, I wait five minutes, you know, for the standing ovation to die down at the end and, yep. and then, uh, <laughs> and then I'm done. Um, but you know, one thing that, that became apparent, um, on this tour and I'm very glad I did it. Um, it kind of gets you out of your echo chamber and out of your box and, you know, we can stay at home and, and, and in these little true crime communities, you know, with us, it's the Maura Murray case, right? And we, we, we're so immersed in this case that we think uh, everybody knows all the details and everybody's familiar with Moore's case. And I'll tell you, you know, even after all the publicity that uh, you guys have provided and uh, the book has provided and, and the documentaries provided, um, nine, to- nine, people, nine out of ten people out there don't know who the hell Maura Murray is. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of eye opening. Uh, so, um, it just kind of shows you that, uh, you know, it's, you, you can get caught in an echo, echo chamber sometimes. Oh, sure. You mean when, when we just release episode after episode on this uh, podcast with their name and you have the blog, you do get caught up in this echo chamber. I, I can imagine how, uh, I guess uh, refreshing it is to open yourself up to uh, a new audience and and yeah. reintroduce yourself or or newly introduce yourself to, right. to a new group of people. Right, right. It's um that's that's what I enjoy about it. Now, do you tell uh, any more stories? I do a little bit, not much. Um, you know, I just kind of give an overview of the case and uh, how I got involved in it. I tell the uh, 
the story about the um, Dirtbag 112 uh, video um, on the eighth anniversary and, and how all that shook down. Um, nice. That's about it. I, I talked more about Amy Mihalovic, uh and, um, you know, how I got involved in true crime and, you know, some of the weird situations I've got into. Like there's this one story I, I, I tell where, you know, everybody has this image in their mind of a, um, you know, when they think of reporter, they think of these seedy journalists who dig through people's garbage. And, uh, you know, I, I'm like, that that never really happens. That's, the, you know, that's kind of ridiculous, except for once. And uh, and then I tell the story about how I dug through this guy's garbage. And um, he he was a uh, he was a suspect in the Amy Mihalovic case and a really good suspect. And um, I went to his house and tried to uh, question him and knocked on the door and he opens it up. And there are these three cats that that come out around his, his feet. And uh, they're like these giant cats, like Maine Coon long haired cats. I'm trying to question him, but I'm fiercely allergic to cats. As soon as I see him, my eyes start to water. And, you know, so I, I'm like, where were you the, you know, the night that, that uh, Amy Mihalovic disappeared? And then I'm sneezing and I'm, I'm trying to interrogate this guy while I'm having a, an allergy attack. And finally, he just gets frustrated and says, all right, sport. He's like, get out, you know, get off my, my property. And so I leave and I realize, oh, my God, I've tipped this guy off. Now he's got to get rid of the evidence. And mind you, I'm 23, 24 years old at the time, um, young, dumb, and stupid. And uh, so, but I'm thinking, I, I tip this guy off. He's going to get rid of the the evidence, and he, you know, he'll probably throw it away. And so, uh, what I do when I get home, I call up the waste management company, and I'm like, "Hey, um, I just moved to, and I named the guy Street. When do I put out my lawn, my uh, garbage?" on the lawn and uh and they say oh it's thursday night and we'll come to pick it up friday morning so put it out thursday night so thursday night rolls around two o'clock in the morning i go to target um that day and i buy like twenty dollars worth of like black clothing because that's what you're supposed to wear and uh i drive up two o'clock <laughs> in the morning to this guy's house and i park like just to be safe i park like a half mile away um so and jog there and by the time i'm there i'm like out of breath and but it worked like all the garbage was on the lawn, the front lawn. And, and so I pick up the first bag and it's heavy, like criminally heavy. Like there must be a torso inside this bag. And so I'm like, I got this bastard. And uh, so I run back to the car and toss it in the back seat, drive to a 24 hour convenience store, run around to the back, grab the bag and rip it open like a bag of peanuts and cat litter and cat turds went everywhere <laughs> oh there you go and you're allergic <laughs> i'm fiercely allergic, and it smells like death it's disgusting and i realize not all the turds are solid and it's droopy and and like just the worst and so so then i have to go to a 24-hour like car wash and i'm that creep at three o'clock in the morning fiercely vacuuming out his back seat like he just killed somebody yeah the um, tables have turned right uh so um yeah sometimes journalists go digging through garbage, but usually it's only like once. And then, now, then is this up. legal? Oh, it's totally legal in Ohio anyways. Like as soon as you put your stuff on the, the oh, okay. we call it the, we call it the tree lawn here, also known as the devil strip. And uh, as soon as it's out there, it's, it's, uh, it's free reign. Okay. And that's the only time you've dug through someone's garbage. Um, well, now that I think about it, uh, I guess uh, that's not entirely true, but I've talked about that in the uh, True Crime Attic book. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you caught me. Maybe one other time. <laughs> uh, I'm like the I'm like the Renner whisperer. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, there's been some news that you um, that you teased and then uh, and then put out there on your blog recently. Uh, do you want to uh, get into that? Uh, sure, I can talk about it a little bit. Um, so as, as some people might know, uh, um, I reported about a year, uh, man, it's been like maybe like a year and a half, um, that Bill Roush, uh, who was Moore Murray's boyfriend at the time of her disappearance, was under investigation for sex assault in uh, Washington, D.C. And, uh, and then I reported that there was an indictment uh, imminent, and then the indictment was served. 
um, I think April of, of this past year, finally. And this is regarding an incident that happened in 2011. Uh, while he was the director or, or, or he worked for uh, Ray Group International, uh, which I believe was a nonprofit that helped veterans. And, uh, um, you know, the, the full story is on my blog, but uh, suffice it to say, this woman is alleging that he um, attempted to rape her in the office of the president of Ray Group International. And uh, the attack was interrupted by a coworker who happened to come back to the office, luckily. And uh, when they heard her come through the door, Bill jumped off her and, um, and hid underneath uh, a desk and told her, uh, don't say a word of this, uh, this never happened. And um, then the woman's friend helps her get out. Now, um, this wasn't the first time he attacked this woman. Um, it was the first time he attacked her sexually, but uh, in, in the weeks leading up to this attack in March of 2011, um, she was uh, going up the escalators in the metro. And if you have ever been in the metro system in DC, these escalators are like two stories tall. They're very scary, you know, escalators. And um, she was riding the escalator and uh, somebody pushed her down uh, hard enough where she hurt herself pretty bad and it ripped her clothing. She had to go home and change. But at, when she was knocked down, she looked up and she saw, she saw Bill. And uh, so she went home and got changed and came back and confronted him in the office and said, what the hell? Why did you push me down the stairs on the metro? And he kind of laughed it off and said, oh, that wasn't me. You must have seen somebody else. But when he was attacking her in March of that year, according to this woman, he one of the first things he said was, OK, yes, that was me on the metro. Um, so some some rough stuff. And the only reason he wasn't prosecuted for that crime, by the way, is because uh, the statute of limitations had run out um, Okay. by the time that uh, this, this last spring rolled around. What was um, the, what was the uh, allegation? Was it the allegation of abuse in the office or was it allegations of um, what he did or what he allegedly did on the uh, Metro? Uh, I, I'm not sure I understand your question. The, the, so she reported all this to police and they ended up charging him for the assault in the, the sexual assault in the office. Oh, I see. Gotcha. I, yeah. I guess my, my question was, was he charged for, or is there a charge for um, pushing, pushing her down no. the stairs in the, in the Metro? No, that would be just a simple assault, uh, apparently. Although in my mind, that's, if you're pushing somebody down the, the Metro, in my mind, that's an attempted murder. But, um, uh, anyways, it, they would have, it would have been assault and they, uh, it was beyond the statute of limitations. So, uh, we're unable to charge him. And once her story became public, um, you know, uh, you know, five other women have contacted me, um, alleging offenses from, uh, from sexual harassment, from simple sexual harassment, all the way to, um, this woman claims he choked her, uh, when he was at Fort Sill. This was six months after Mora's disappearance and, uh, choked her and, uh, said, I'm going to kill you like I killed Mora. Um, that woman, uh, is, um, was a, um, wife of, uh, of another uh, soldier um, at Fort Sill who was sent away. So, um, so anyways, the, the, the new stuff that's come out is uh, uh, I had to go to D.C. about two weeks ago, and while I was there, um, these new allegations came forward. A new woman went to the police. And this is a woman who uh, I, I've known about for a couple of years. I knew that um, she was... Uh, seeing Bill. Um, Bill has separated uh, from his wife. I don't know, uh, you know, where they are with a divorce or anything like that. But um, this woman was seeing him and, uh, you know, she was no fan of mine and, uh, and it had said as much. Um, and then she kind of went quiet and I didn't hear from her for a while. And, 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 uh, and then she comes out with these, these allegations. So I find these allegations to be extremely credible because this woman knows Bill Roush better than, um, better than anybody else, I think. I, I think better than his wife knew him. And uh, um, so just real quick, what she's alleging is that, um, you know, their relationship started with um, um, essentially what would have been a sexual assault um, or at least very aggressive 
moved by Bill, he invited her into his office and, and threw her up against the door and proceeded to kiss her and then walked her back to her desk and uh, made sure that all of her G-chat messages between him and her were deleted. Um, and then he would hit her, you know. Um, this is what she's alleging, uh, that he hit her so hard once that he uh, chipped a tooth. Um, she says on two occasions he choked her and called her Mora and uh, would say very demeaning things would call her Mora and say, you're a bitch, and even more demeaning things uh, after that. That really alarmed her. Um, there was an incident that happened on Valentine's Day where uh, Bill tossed her into the air inside her apartment, um, and she ended up uh, hitting her head on a light, uh, which caused a large gash. Blood was everywhere. Um, and, uh, you know, he insisted on riding to the hospital with her in the ambulance and staying by her side when doctors questioned her um, and told the nurse to make him her emergency contact. Um, and it's my belief that he wouldn't leave her side during that hospital visit because he was afraid of uh, a domestic violence uh, allegation. Um, one, uh, at least one of these assaults took place while Bill was um, at an overseas military base, which means that uh, should, um, she, uh, it, it means that he, this could result in charges through military court channels, um, which would be kind of a, a big deal. Um, and then, you know, she, um, you know, another thing that came out was all this stuff where Bill was using fake social media accounts to, um, harass me and, uh, and also to kind of steer the narrative of, uh, the online investigation into Maura Murray's disappearance. So some serious allegations. Uh, they might lead to more charges. Um, he's been served with a restraining order. He's to go nowhere near this woman. Uh, That's her, based on the new allegations? Yeah, the, the new oh, okay. allegations. And if if he goes near her, he'll, he'll be arrested. Wow. Is, is this stuff, was this documented in court or is this, uh, yes. I know this is stuff that you posted about, but okay. So, uh, you, you got legal documents about this stuff too? Yes. I have the police report. Um, and, uh, the, um, I've been able to verify that the restraining order was served, uh, late last week. So Bill has it. And, uh, there's court record of that, um, uh, restraining order and their attempts to, I, I don't know what, what's going to happen next with the civil case, but um, at the very least he's, he's facing some kind of uh, case there as well. When were you first uh, connected to the alleged victim? Um, I don't want to get too much into that. Uh, okay. I've been asked not to go into the details about um, any sort of uh, communication. If, if, if some communication does exist with the, with the victim um, but, uh, this was news to me as of about two weeks ago. I, I, um, I knew of the woman and I suspected, uh, I suspected abuse because I had heard about the, um, the Valentine's day incident, uh, from other people. Um, mm -hmm. but I didn't know the extent, uh, of the abuse until about two weeks ago. Now, do you have any, uh, indication that, say the the medical records have been filed with the proper authorities at this point you said that she chipped a tooth i don't know did she get that fixed at uh, you know at a dentist or um the gash in her head i think head? she from my understanding is she has excellent document documentation i i have i will say i i have seen documentation of his um obsessive um stalking and, and harassing behavior so she kept she kept uh uh she kept uh, photographs and documents. Um, but, uh, I will say that, um, one thing I, I have seen that's part of the police record by now, I'm sure. Um, I, although we shouldn't assume anything, um, but, um, she kept, uh, very detailed notes of, um, uh, he, she broke off the relationship with Bill in March. I believe it was March 6th. And she, she's very clear. I don't want any more contact. And she logged every single time he tried to contact her. And he reached out through phone, through text, through 
Facebook, through Twitter, through WhatsApp. Uh, when he couldn't reach her, he sent presents. He sent a, a laptop to her apartment. Then he showed up at her apartment and slipped a piece of paper under her door and said he was thinking about committing suicide. And um, you know, he was just relentless. And, you know, she's, he would show up when, when she was like at a restaurant somewhere. He, she would look up and he would be walking across the street when he lives across town. Um, and we're talking like we're hundreds, hundreds of, of attempted contacts there after she says no. And you said earlier on that this victim, this alleged victim, didn't like you at first and has since changed uh, her feelings about you and now now reached out to you. Well, you know, I, I will say this. I don't know that she... I don't know that even today, or well, two things I want to say. One, I, I'm not saying that she reached out to me. Two, I want to say that I, I'm, I don't, I don't know that I would say that she likes me right now. Okay. Okay. Um, so, okay. Wait, I guess. So, what do you mean? You wouldn't say she reached out to you, but you, you were yeah. in contact with her. I, I can't say to what extent if I have been in contact with her. I, I can't I can't get into the details of that because of these these court cases. Okay. Okay. Um now I guess the conversation sort of naturally leads to is this related to Maura Murray? Um I will say this. I, I'll say that the victim has alleged that uh she would like to talk to the detectives in the Moore Murray case. And I don't know if they have reached out to her yet. I don't know if she's connected with them. Um, but uh, there is this story that she has told um, that uh, always creeped her out. Um, and that was a story, you know, there's, there's all these reports that you know, Bill couldn't possibly have done it. Um, and I, I, I'm not here to tell you, I think it, it was Bill. I, I don't know. I, I'm still holding out hope that Moore got away because the more and more I learned, the more I realized that she had motive to get away and to want a safer place and a safer life. And dear God, I hope, I mean, wouldn't that be a great ending? Sure would. But for the people that say that there's, you know, no way, um, uh, you know, all these people are, the, the, the family's, I, I think official line is that Bill was with them, uh, as soon as he got into New Hampshire for the for the duration, and that's simply not true. Um, he was he was mostly with his father, and you can look at his cell phone records and see they were all over the place. They were up into Vermont, all the way towards Maine. Um, they were they were all over the place. So um, he told uh, this um, uh, allegedly he told this woman a story. Uh, about how he and his father came across this shed uh, in the middle of nowhere, and he felt that Mora was inside. And uh, they they got to the shed and and they did investigation and they got I don't know if they got into the shed or what, but uh, you know he says well she wasn't there. But this for some reason he told the story a couple times and that story has stuck out to this woman and. She, there's something about that story that doesn't sit right with her. And she would like to discuss that with the um, detectives in uh, New Hampshire. I got to go back on that a little bit. This is a story that she was told by Bill. Where did yeah. this story come from? Uh, from Bill to her. Okay. Bill allegedly told her a story that he was searching for Mora with his own father and came across this shed in the middle of the woods. And he just had this sixth sense that she was in there, that Mora was in there. Correct. That's a story that he allegedly told this woman. Correct. What do you think that was? Do you think if this is true, do you think that was Bill's way of saying something about like, maybe it was a confession almost, or do you think that he was just saying something to scare her or, do you think it actually happened? What Bill likes to do and what he's been trained to do is um, mix falsehoods with truth in order to give it credibility and to make it sound like it has a ring of truth to it. And this was the, the, the feeling that she got when he told her 
this story. Did she document that anywhere? I'm sure she did. Okay. Um, and she wants to talk to the cold case unit about that. Did she, do you know if she emailed them or anything or I, well, I guess you, you, uh, I don't, I don't know. Wouldn't, uh, no. Wow. Well, that's, that's all pretty interesting. So, so you're saying that that was right after Mora went missing that he was, Bill was searching with his dad. Yeah. We're talking like Wednesday or Thursday that week. Why don't we ever hear more about Bill's dad? Uh, good question. I don't know. Are they, were they married still at the time? I think so. They're still married now, right? I don't know. I have no idea. That's really interesting that we could do so much work on this and not know if uh, his parents are still together. And not know if he, like, I, I, that, this is the first that I've ever heard that his dad was there during the searches. Have you ever heard that, Tim? Uh, I don't think so. Have you heard that before this woman told you this, James? Yeah, I had heard that. Oh, okay. Yeah, maybe I forgot. I just I couldn't uh, recall. I, I do remember hearing about his mom being there and yeah. taking notes and such. Okay, so you you said that according to some phone records, were are these the phone records of Bill and his dad? They're no, these cell are, phone records. Um, no, if you look at Bill's roaming, uh, it's it's the phone records that are out in the public now. Okay. Um, and if you look at Bill's phone records, look at the roaming, the roaming, uh, the roaming uh, calls list the uh i think the routed um tower that was closest so uh it'll have locations on the roaming charges so it's like this roaming call came in through you know manchester new hampshire um there was one that came in through streaked mountain maine um there was another that came in from vermont so you can kind of map and at one point i did you take all these roaming charges and kind of build a map based on the time frame um, and again, that also, when you look at those, those phone records, you also, again, you come to the five days during that search where Bill, who is constantly using his phone before then, um, you know, making 60, 70 calls a day goes completely radio silent. Um, you know, there's, there's a couple calls on that set. It just, you know, so I don't know, we're back to talking about the weirdness of the phone the phone bells, but, um, I don't know what to make of it. Um, again, I, I hold out hope that, uh, that she's alive and, and all we're dealing with here is, um, somebody that wanted to get away would be the best case scenario. Do you feel that you've been wrongly vilified for your work into this case? I don't think I have, well, first of all, I don't think I have been vilified. Uh, if I have, it's by, you know, again, we, we get back to this idea of the echo chamber. Um, you know, it's it's a very small but very very loud um, group of individuals that have a problem with the way I've reported things in this case. Um, but you know, I get I get wonderful emails um, and and reviews uh, on on the book. Um, you know, every week. So I try to concentrate on those. Of course, you know, it's the one in ten that that come in that that really bum you out that you end up focusing on sometimes. Um, but, uh, you know, as far as un unfairly, um, you know, to, to, to an extent, um, you know, and I think it goes back to, you know, um, uh, if we want to open up this story, you know, the, the creation of the documentary and, uh, working with, um, with the production team on that, uh, and we're, this, this takes you back to the fall of 2016, where, uh, I was first approached about this documentary for the Oxygen Network and wanted to help them with research and everything. And we came to an arrangement and, uh, you know, so they, they flew me, I think they flew you guys out too, but they, they flew me out to Austin in the fall of 2016. And, uh, you know, I remember sitting down in their office and going over the whole case and providing them with all these documents. And they're just a really great group of people um you know and that's the first time i met art broderick and you know he's um he's certainly um somebody to look up to uh, just a yeah. new guy and uh and david and, and that whole crew but you know one thing that came out in that meeting was they're like look we're going to be honest with you um we really want to get the family on board uh and fred murray but we think the only way we can get fred murray is if you um, is, is if we allow him to attack you, 
um, and if we allow him to um, say some some mean things about you, and uh, and if we take apart your you know some of these theories that you've come up with online, and uh, you know my my answer was pretty quick. I, you know I I said you know do whatever you can. I think it's very important that you get Fred Murray on on record. I think that would you know just for history um, to have that and to have his version of of events uh, in essentially stone, you know, in his words. Let's get that. Let's have that. That's important. So, you know, I told him, I'm like, whatever you need to do, do it. So you were essentially uh, enlisted to be the bad guy of the yeah. series. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, I hear about this and mind you, it's nine months before that, that documentary series is going to run. Right. And so I'm sitting and thinking and digesting that for nine months, knowing that this is going to be a national platform. And, um, you know, I have no idea how they're going to make me look in general, but, um, uh, but I know for sure that Fred's going to say some mean things. And, um, and that's, that's a hard thing to, to have to sit and, and stew over for nine months. And, uh, um, and it was, that was probably the most difficult, um, uh, time. Uh, and, it's actually, you know, I, I, I've been talking more and more about, uh, and I talk about this in the, in the tour that I do in the road show where, you know, I, I do talk about, uh, mental health and, and the issues and, yeah. you know, everybody I know that's doing something creative, um, and regardless of creative, everybody I know that's my age is going through, um, a bit of an existential crisis. You know, some of my friends are getting divorced. Um, you know, some of them are, um, going through health concerns, and, and some of them are, are having mental health issues. And, you know, I've always uh, had, um, I always knew I was, I was like skating the fine line of, uh, of, of substance abuse and, and alcoholism. And, um, and, and that was always a concern because, you know, that runs in my family, so does depression. And um, so <laughs> I, it was at that when I flew down to Austin and I had this meeting with the production company and, and it just kind of hit me all at once. Like, damn, like I'm going to have to, <laughs> like, this is going to be hard. I've got to wait nine months to see how bad, you know, uh, I'm, I'm portrayed. And, and for the record, uh, I think they did an excellent do job on the documentary and, and I think they were very fair about me. And I, and I think they gave people the option to draw their own conclusions about who, uh, who you ultimately want to believe and, and what everybody's agenda is. Yeah. So, you know, good Yeah, for you them. definitely didn't come off looking like this overt, no. like, sinister villain. Right, right. So um, it was so much worse in my imagination. But Of course. Uh, so I go back to the hotel after this meeting, and I have, um, it took me a while to realize I was having a, a nervous breakdown. And, um, uh, the, the first, um, you know, the, the first real sign was, I, I, I don't know if they put you up in the same hotel, but it's this like six story, beautiful hotel with this atrium in the middle. Yeah. And, uh, there's like a swan swimming in like a river on, on the bottom level. Um, but th they put my room all the way up at the top. It's the sixth floor. And I get out of the elevator, and on the Please left... Please tell me you did not ju jump into the swan pool. <laughs> but my concern was that I might. Um, oh. I, so I get off on the sixth floor, and there's a railing on my left. And um, I just got, you know, they, there's a French term for it, and I can't remember what it is. But it's, it's, the, it's that, the, the pull of the void. In English, it's called the pull of the void. Um, it's that, that, that feeling you get that some people get when you go on a, uh, you're standing on a cliff and it's like, well, what if, you know, what if I jumped? And that voice was so loud at that moment that I had to physically uh, put my back up against the wall across from the, the railing so that I could touch the wall all the way back to my room so that I, I wouldn't be close enough that, that I could jump. You know, so I get back to my room and then later we all meet up for dinner and, uh, and Art's there, and, uh, you know, we're, we're all having sushi, and, and um, we got, everybody was drinking, and I knew I shouldn't be drinking, um, and, uh, you know, I drank way too, I tried to keep up with Art, you know, and that's... Yeah, good luck. 
yeah, it's like, you know, eventually that becomes like that scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, and uh, um, where you're trying to, to match each other and you just can't keep up with art. So, um, <laughs> so I, I get back to the hotel and uh, drinking always makes me, you know, it's a depressant, right? You know, you feel that euphoria, which is awesome, but then it wipes, wipes you out, man. And uh, so I'm already feeling crummy. I get in the elevator to get up to my hotel room, knowing that I'm going to have to like watch out for the railing again. And, uh, and then Art steps into the elevator and we start going up and, I, and I'm like, oh, you're staying in this hotel too? And he's like, yeah. Uh, I'm like, oh, okay. And uh, so we get off at the sixth floor and we're walking into my room and Art keeps following me. And I'm like, where the hell's your room? And I realize, like, as I get there, that they've put Art right next to my room. And then, of course, like, you know, I, I'm already, like, having essentially a breakdown. And, and so I become convinced that they've got my room wired so that they can listen in on, like, any sort of messages that I'm, I'm you know, the conversations I'm having with my wife about, you know, about the production or about the, you know, the 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 show or you know who knows what and you know because i'm paranoid beyond you know delusion at this point and so i completely take apart that room looking for uh looking for cameras looking for um microphones and uh uh it was <laughs> it was a rough night and uh um you know i realized that i needed to do something about my uh anxiety so that i could get through the next, uh, through these next nine months. So your entire, uh, room, you, you took apart and I can't help it. I'm not trying to make a joke, but I, uh, (laughs) I can't help but think of the, the final like sequence in that movie. Um, great movie called the conversation with Gene Hackman where he completely dismantles his apartment. He's pulling up the floorboards and he's (laughs) pulling out the wall and then the end, he's just kind of sitting there and then he doesn't find anything, but you had this building anxiety, anxiety and paranoia and it was capped off by you realizing that art was on the same floor as you, um, close to your room. And what was that like? So you get into your room and you just couldn't, you just couldn't stop yourself. How were you able to stop? What was it like when you finally like took a step back and, and you thought to yourself that this was probably quite irrational? Um, I mean, it was, <laughs> you know, it, it, the funny thing is if you, if you go to the documentary, they almost did this exact same thing, right? Will, will you remember the interview with, with Kathleen Murray um, you know, so as I'm watching that, that, that documentary, by the way, nine months later, and I'm seeing that episode with Kathleen where they're doing exactly what I, you know, had in my mind. And I'm like, fuck, <laughs> you know, did I, maybe I didn't look hard enough. Um, but, uh, no, I, I, uh, you know, I didn't like tear up the floorboards or anything, but I was, I was on my back underneath the, the, the table and the desk, um, you know, checking for. Like I like I would even know what a uh, what a bug would look like. By the way, um, right? Oh, I think you'd know. I think you. I think you'd have a pretty good idea that it, it shouldn't be there. Probably, probably. Uh, but eventually, Julie called uh, to check in, and um, your wife. Yeah, and and I explained to her um, what I was doing, and she's like, "Well, uh, you're crazy, and uh, and I'm going to talk you down." And uh, so that was helpful. Okay. Well, good. I'm glad you've, uh, you've come out of that. Yeah. And think things have been better since. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I'm, I'm in a good place, uh, now and the family's good and, um, yeah, all is, all is well. Um, does your anxiety go up, um, when you like, uh, like, do you revisit these feelings when you, um, post about, uh, like Bill and, and stuff like that? Uh, not anymore. I used to, um, you know, I, I think it took, you know, maybe the tours helped a little bit, but um, uh, it took a while for me to get uh, a an objective, true look at, uh, at, at this case. And it's not as big as, you know, as it feels when you're when you're in it. Um, you know, so, there, you know, a couple things. One, you know, I am slowly pulling away from this case. You know, I'm not spending 
most of my time anymore trying to find out what happened to Maura Murray. I've got a pretty good I- idea, you know, uh, it's one of two, two things, but uh, I do feel the obligation and, uh, and the responsibility to, to report on um, major things that happen as they occur um, so that people can read uh, what, what is hopefully a, um, uh, a fair assessment of that, because I don't think that, uh, that they can get that fair assessment um, online in, uh, in, in other blogs or other, or other locations. So, and especially with the Bill Roush thing, you know, I, I, I know these, these women now, um, and they're, they trust me to tell their story and to tell it right. So, um, I do feel a, a responsibility to continue covering that, but, uh, I have no desire to update the blog every day. Like I used to back in 2012-2013. Now, I'm curious what the purpose is of posting these uh, findings that you have online on on your blog. Uh, there's a sense of sensationalism to it, to it, but what is your what is your objective when you per, when you post something uh, like what you've been posting about about Bill and these allegations? Um, I don't know. I mean, where's the, where's the sensationalizing? Um, where does that, who, who's saying that they're sensational? Oh, I'm saying, um, I'm saying that by, by seeing it online, one could look at it and say that this is in a form sensationalizing you as, you know, you're sensationalizing yourself as a journalist. I don't know. I don't know if I agree with that, but, um, the, I guess, the the basic question there is why would I why would I post it on my blog say and not a um, and not a newspaper site or and, or why post it anywhere? Uh, well, um, for this, I think it's very uh, I think it is important in Morris case um, because at the very least we're understanding the type of person that was in a relationship with Mora at the time of her disappearance. And we're, what we're looking for is motive for her to uh, get away or to run away or to just want to be away. And uh, I, think Bill, I think understanding who Bill Roush is uh, certainly provides the motive for her to want to, to, to get away for at the very least a small amount of time, but if not for good. Um, I think what we know about him now, uh, suggests that she could have been successful in finding a battered woman in shelter or, uh, a, a nonprofit for domestic violence that could set her up with a new, um, identity. But do you think that, you know, or have you explored the idea that Bill's behavior has come as a result of Mora's disappearance and not um, what was it happening before her disappearance? It absolutely was happening before her disappearance. Um, there's uh, these allegations go all the way back to high school where he had a reputation of being rough with women. Where is that? I don't think I've seen that. I've, I've reported on that in the past. Um, it's probably still on my blog, but uh, I spoke with um, uh, an ex-girlfriend of his uh, back in Ohio. So um, the allegations go back before Mora and also, um, you know, the, there were members of Mora's track team, uh, Nast, uh, Shams for one, um, who were trying to get her to break up with Bill because of his controlling behavior. Um, but uh, I, I've, there's never been anything documented where Mora said that he was abusive in any way, right? Not that I've heard. Do you mind if I just get back to uh, the topic uh, that we were just talking about? So is are you saying that the purpose of putting this information out there is to satisfy the the people who have been looking into this case and, and we're essentially doing it as well. So I'm not trying to like cast stones or anything. I'm just yeah. really trying to wrap my own head around this. The purpose of putting this information out there is to satisfy the people who have been looking at this case so so they can finally have answers. They can finally have some sort of um, information that will lead to answers. No, my my main motivation for putting it out there is because every time I do, another woman comes forward. Ah, so by gotcha. sharing this information, um, I, I'm hoping that 
anybody else that has had a run-in with this guy. Um, and perhaps that run-in would provide more information on other cases, um, would see this. And, um, you know, I think there's strength in numbers, right? Um, yeah. Where the more come out, the, the, the more likely that, um, you know, somebody out there who's afraid to do so will find the strength to do so. Right. And part of my reason for asking that question is that you put yourself in the crosshairs quite often when you put this information out there. So I'm wondering if you see yourself as uh, a, a virtual form of collateral damage. Mm. I don't think uh, no, that's not how I <laughs> that's not how I look at it. I, I just um, again, I, I, I think it's a it's a responsibility. I'd rather not be the one that's putting it out there. But uh, nobody else is reporting on it at this point, although the D.C. City paper is, you know, covering some of the developments with the the legal cases. Um, uh, yeah, no, I. I'd, uh, I'd prefer to be writing novels and uh, and and hanging out and, uh, and and having fun. Um, well, speaking of novels, I am still waiting on my signed copy of Muse. You didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, <laughs> I did not. Uh, uh, it must have it must have gotten lost in the move. That's that's bullshit, man. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but also back to what Tim was bringing up, which made me think of this. It's it, it's almost uh, within the same um, topic. Is there there's nothing there's there's allegations from other people that you said are dating back previous to Mora, but Mora never never specifically told anybody that um that that this had happened. Are you that are you anticipating someone might come forward eventually who said, Yeah, I went to I went to school with Mora and she did say these things? I would I believe so. I believe I believe and it would be great, you know, if that person would come forward. I, I you know Looking at this pattern of behavior, I would say I would be uh, very surprised if it didn't, if it if it hadn't happened with Mora. Mm -hmm. Okay, so should we um, point people to your email address if if there is anyone out there who fits this this uh, category that, that would like to come forward? Uh, you know, I, I think you just go to the blog. You know, the uh, which I think is still moramurray.blogspot.com. You know, it, you can read about uh, the reports there, um, and uh, there's also, you know, I also provide a way to um, send in tips and to contact me that uh, will not give up your identity. Um, so there's a there's a program that you can use to send in tips that way too. All right, great. Um... Is there any information on that that weird uh, little shed that she had said Bill told her that he thought Mora was in? Is I haven't there... heard. Any. I don't know. Uh, I don't think she had much more. But yeah, I, I just I, I'm very much looking forward to the day that this case is uh, done, and I you know I'd like it sooner than later, um, whatever the answer is, uh, so that uh, that we can do other things. Speaking of other things, you mentioned your nonprofit. What is this nonprofit you speak of? Um, so it's called the Porchlight Project, and we focus on uh, cold cases in North Ohio, Northern Ohio, and we're, we're hoping to pick a new case every three months or so. And uh, we we provide um, anything from investigative uh, services to. Uh, you know, wh whatever they need to solve some of these cases that are 10 years old or older. Um, in the case of Barbara Blatnick, which is our first case, uh, we are providing money, uh, the funds for new DNA testing and also forensic genealogy. Um, Barbara was a uh, young woman who was murdered in 1987. She was from Garfield Heights, but her body was found near Blossom Music Center out here in uh, Cuyahoga Falls. And uh, her murder's never been solved, but they had good DNA from under her finger, uh, fingernails. And so we've provided the funding to, we, ra we raised about $5,000, and that's going to pay for uh, tests in an independent lab, which have just been done. And uh, the data then goes to these forensic genealogists who um, 
And, and the, the ones that we're using are Identifinders, which is run by Colleen Fitzpatrick in Southern California. And she's the woman who uh, legitimately wrote the book, Forensic Genealogy. So she knows what she's doing. And uh, hopefully we're going to be, uh, we'll have enough data to um, find a match to the, the killer uh, through uh, his family tree. You know, maybe we'll find a second cousin and then the genealogist will trace the family tree back to this this man who was at the scene of the crime. Um, and uh, I'm very optimistic. I think this case is going to be solved in the next few weeks because of this. And oh, the uh, next few weeks. Very good. Yeah. Um, so uh, hopefully we'll get an answer on the Barbie Blatnick case and then be able to do more and more and more of these cases. That's great. Any other books that you have coming up? What's in the works on uh, that? On that um, end? I got another book coming out probably late 2020, but it's a little early to, to talk about that. Um, okay. I'm starting to work on a new season of the philosophy of crime, my podcast. Uh, if Fantastic. You, yeah. So if your listeners haven't, haven't caught that yet, um, you know, the philosophy of crime is available on any, you know, podcast platform. And, uh, there are two seasons out, 12 episodes, um, six episodes every season. And, and it looks at the big questions behind true crime. Like why are we obsessed with true crime? Do lie detectors really work? How does criminal profiling work? What are the ethics of familial DNA? Stuff like that. And then it goes uh, to classical philosophy for uh, answers. So, you know, what would Socrates say about this? What would Michel Foucault have to say about familial DNA? Um, so it, it's, a, it's a neat little mix of philosophy and, and true crime. Awesome. Awesome. Do Thanks. you ever get that feeling uh, of, um, I think it's actually pronounced lapel du vide? The uh, um, call to the, the to the void. Do you get that feeling still? Has that come back? Oh, very good. Did you have to look that up, or did you know that, James? Of course, I had to look that up. <laughs> <laughs> you think I knew this off the top of my head? I've been for the last twenty minutes. I've been trying to figure out how to say it. You do have a little of that uh, je ne sais quoi. Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> do I do I still get it? Um, of course, yeah, but not to not to the extent. I think everybody gets it, right? But. Um, it's not something that I'd worry about anymore following through with. Um, so I've, I've definitely uh, come out the other side. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of grateful that I went, went through that experience because it, it gave me a better, uh, more realistic um, look at, at, uh, at life and reality and, and also what's important. And, um, you know, I, I enjoy, I've been doing a lot of traveling lately, but uh, there's nothing that makes me happier than being home. Yeah. Um, with my kids, you know, and, uh, you know, Casey's 12 now and, uh, and Lane's seven. So I realized the other day that I'm exactly halfway through having kids in my house. Um, you know, in another 12, Casey's 12 and in another 12 years, Laney will be going to college. Um, so that, that kind of hit me. It's like, wow, I'm halfway through. So, mm. uh, you know, I better, uh, I better enjoy this. Yeah, yeah. And do you think that the um this feeling, this call to the void was uh something that the psychic that you went to um and you told us about in the <laughs> Finding More Murray documentary, is that what she was indicating when she uh was was sending you uh, pretty overt warnings? You know, I've never I never thought about that. I never made that connection, but uh I like it. Well, Tim, but... Tim, where's the breaking news uh sound effect? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Have you gone back to Gene the Psychic? <laughs> I the almost psychic. did. I almost did. We were in Ocean City again this year. Um, and uh, I thought about taking Casey there. And then uh, we we ended up getting busy eating like an elephant ear or something. But <laughs> I, I, I was like five feet away from her like front door and I, I thought about it. But I didn't. I, part of me didn't want to ruin the magic of what happened that uh, that first time. Um, <laughs> must have been a great elephant ear. Oh, it was, it, I mean, they put like fudge on top of it and, and, and I'm still very unclear as to what an elephant ear is. I even, I even Googled and binged it. And is it just like a crusty piece of dough? Yeah. Yeah. That's all it is. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 but it's delicious. Uh, but it, it's, it looks delicious. I was just unsure if there was something inside of it that I was missing. No, no, no. Just crusty dough. Well, thank you for having me uh, 
back on uh, your your pageant. Um, I always have a <laughs> I always have a great time when I'm on, and then you know there's there's the buyer's remorse uh, that comes later. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah. uh, you know, I I, I guess. You know, I just I just want to say, you know, we got to let these 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 women, uh, you know, tell their their story and and see where it goes, and uh, you know, maybe it'll get a get us closer to some sort of answer. I don't know. Yeah, agreed, agreed, and and I'm really uh, encouraged by your answer about putting the information out there to hopefully have other people come forward. I think yeah. that's uh, I think that's about as responsible as you can get with uh, with the information that you're given. Thanks. Yeah. Aside it, it, from going to the to law enforcement, which you have. Thank you. Um, and and I'm always very much aware when I post these stories, uh, you know, that that word sensational is in the back of my mind, and I try to write these uh, as you know with as much dignity, you know, as as you can. Um, you know, but people, you know, ultimately make their, their own, uh, opinion, uh, up, you know, for that. Um, and every once in a while, you know, of course I'll get excited about a piece of news and I'll say something stupid on Twitter. Um, because I'm, I'm genuinely like, this is news. This is, people are going to need to see this. This is exciting. This doesn't come in every day. I'm going to get a little, a little excited about it every once in a while.